Our next uh, speaker is another friend of mine. Um, Vanessa Holland and I met uh, approximately a year ago. I was looking for friends at that time. And uh, <clears throat> so I, I collected a few more. And I'm very honored to, uh, to have a pulmonologist who also believes in these uh, uh, horrible little agents that can cause problems in, in patients. Um, you can see Vanessa's uh, bio in the book. And uh, so without saying much more and bragging about her, I'm uh, uh, looking forward to hearing this. And I'll get yours. When Dennis asked me to do this, I said, oh, you got to be kidding. There's not enough data out here for me to present this to you the way I would like to present it to you. I've been a pulmonologist for several years, but it's only recently that I started looking at why are these patients not getting better. I am seeing them going to their allergists, their ENT doctor, but we still have patients who are complaining of these illnesses. In spite of that, even when you have to deal with the allergists, other pulmonologists, ENT, they don't believe a word you have to say. You're always considered an outcast or you're talking off, talking off the top of your head. I work with the residency committee at the School of Public Health, uh, bringing residents in the, to the program, looking at the curriculum, and I can tell you, there is nothing on there dealing with mycotoxins and exposures in the community and the health effects associated with them. I have gone to and been on ACCP committee meetings. Again, we're not dealing with a lot of information, dealing with mycotoxins. First of all, one of the questions they always ask, myco out, fungi everywhere. How can you make sure that these mycotoxins are not everywhere? How can you make sure that they're not related to something else? Have you ruled out other illnesses and problems they give that are responsible for these people's symptoms? And most of all, they're crazy. Usually it's you see a lot of the women who complain about these symptoms more so than men, so they definitely get labeled, especially if they're in office. So what I did was just looked at some of the literature, also looked at what ACCP is saying, also trying to find what ATS is saying. What are they talking about when they come to mycotoxin exposure and respiratory symptoms? As you've seen, this has been a wonderful meeting for me because I've learned just as much as everybody else dealing with it, treatment, the epidemiological data, and also how it relates to managing patients. We all know that the fungi have been associated with numerous health effects, and the health effects have been sy sy sorry, systematic, systemic, allergic respiratory disease, irritants effects, and infections. Mycotoxins are secondary metabolites. We all know that. I love Dr. Harriet's and Dr. Strauss and everybody I've heard so far with their presentation. It has been wonderful. I'd like to start off with a case presentation of somebody that I saw. This is a 65-year-old female who presented with complaints of coughing for the last two weeks. She was evaluated by her pulmonary physician, her, sorry, her primary physician, who diagnosed her with bronchitis, and she was treated with the bronchodilator and oral antibiotics. At the time of her presentation, she complained of coughing. Her, also, her husband also stated that she complained of a low-grade fever. This young lady had been complaining of coughing, coughing, coughing. In spite of giving, being given antibiotics, bronchodilators, she didn't get any better. In addition, she was given oral corticosteroids. Her past medical history was significant for fibromyalgia and bronchiectasis. Although her bronchiectasis, when you looked on CT, was limited to actually one small area of the lung. At the time that she presented to me, she had, was taking only Zopinex. Her social history was important for she was a housewife, no alcohol, no drugs. Her physical examination, very small frame woman, weight 101, her vitus were normal. She was giving inhaled corticosteroids, but she didn't improve. I did a bronchoscopy on her thinking, Here's a small frame lady, fair eyes, fair hair, fair skin. I'm going to get MAI. I know I'm going to get Mycobacterium avium intracellular. 
However, after I bronched her, I distally lavaged her, did biopsies in addition. She grew aspergillus out of every culture. In fact, the lab called me and said, oh my God, you've got aspergillus everywhere. She must be immunocompromised. She must be on oral steroids. Uh, she must be on chemotherapy. And I said, she's on neither. When they grew the cultures, she had fumigatus, teres, alcaricius, niger, multiple aspergillus. I consulted infectious disease. I wish you had you there, Dr. Brewer. And <laughs> the first thing the infectious disease said, that's not important. She doesn't have disseminated aspergillus. I said, you have one choice. Either you treat her or I'm going to find somebody else. Because I'm telling you, this is aspergillus. The last time I had a case like that, and it was very sad for me, a young man with disseminated same thing, lavage, grew aspergillus out of everything. The infectious disease doctor said, oh, it's not real. This is just a colonization. I said, I did the procedure. I know what a distal lavage is. And I also did biopsy. Make a long story short, he refused to, tr to treat him. Another infectious disease came on and said, oh my god, he has disseminated aspergillus. He died within two weeks, leaving a two-year-old. And I, I'm, I'm on guard. First thing she said when, this is not real. You either treat him, treat her, or I'll find somebody else. To make a long story short, she was treated and started on voriconazole. But it was not before she called me. We tried to get the medication as an outpatient. The insurance company refused us. We, after three days of begging these people, sending them the data, they finally decided to give her the medicine because it was expensive. Well, the patient called me on a Thursday morning at 5.30. Don't you hate those 5.30 calls? <laughs> she called and said, I'm dying. I said, excuse me? I'm dying. So I admitted her to the hospital. After she was admitted to the hospital, she had diffuse pulmonary infiltrates. Even though we started on boriconazole, she absolutely whited out her lungs. Believe it or not, through non-invasive ventilation, she improved, but not before I started her on steroids also. So she ended up on boriconazole and prednisone to reverse this inflammatory response that she had developed. She's doing great. She's out of the hospital. I had talked to Dr. Hooper about, I'd like to see what her mycotoxins were. Well, I had to convince her that she needed to let me send the urine. We sent the urine, and this is, sorry, ophrotoxin was identified. She stayed on treatment for six to seven months, has absolutely, totally resolved her symptoms. She's doing quite well. I have not rechecked the urine. I really want to recheck the urine to see what it is. However, I have to get her approval because she didn't want to pay for it if the insurance was not going to pay for it. When I tried to interview her to find out where did this come from, I talked to her about her home. Her husband was adamant. There is no mold in our house. They went from top to bottom. Then I asked her about her church. That's her other activity. There is no mold in this church. Nobody is sick. But the, <laughs> finally she told me, oh, I had some mulch, and I didn't want to throw it away. A hole was in it. It rained on it. So I just put a plastic covering on it. Then when I went to, go, to open it to go feed my bedding, it smelled bad, it looked bad, and it hit me in the face. And I started coughing. I tried to get a, uh, some of that mulch to send it for culture and also to send it for other studies, but she threw it away. Actually, her husband did. So to make a long story short, this is a lady who was not immunocompromised, who still developed uh, invasive aspergillus. And it was documented by bronchoscopy, lavage, in addition to identification of uh, the mycotoxins in the urine. I asked the infectious disease, would you use the mycotoxins as a way of monitoring the patient, or would you use the mycotoxins as a diagnostic tool? What's that? I said, excuse me? You don't know what mycotoxins are? And this is a young lady is a recent graduate. She's not old. 
She's not been out for years and years. And she said, no, I have no need for them. Mycotoxins are not helpful for any type of treatment, and they don't tell us anything. Now, when I graduate from med medical school, residency, fellowship, there was no information on mycotoxins. It didn't exist, and I'm not surprised for my generation. But for this new group, why not environmental issues being part of what we deal with? She absolutely had absolutely no indication, no knowledge of it, and was not interested in learning anything about mycotoxins. So when we talk about mycotoxins, we already know that they're low molecular weight, uh, they can be found on more spores that produce them, on the fragments, dust substrates, carpet dust. When I see patients, and as a pulmonologist, I usually get referral from patients or from other physicians who are tired of dealing with them. I hate to say that. Most of my patients are, I'm tired of dealing with them, go see somebody else. Or ENT, there's nothing wrong with you, go see somebody else. That's the referrals I get. I rarely get the patients coming to me directly who have had water intrusion in their building, in their home. Part of the reason, I'm out of network. And they don't want to pay for a first time visit without having somebody in network. They go to family practice, they go to ENT, they go to their allergists, but they don't come to me. By the time they see me, they have been steroid up, cushionoid up, and absolutely, you, they come in, you go, oh my God, <laughs> I gotta start from scratch on this. But they're so cushionoid, where they have been treated with steroid after steroid after steroid. And then you have to decide how much is it, this is adrenaline sufficiency, how long you've been on it, when did you get off of it? So it becomes a real dilemma for me. We know that the mycotoxins can be carcinogens, hepatic toxic, nephrotoxic, and mutagenic. We have gone over this before, but I wanted to say something about this. The chemical nature of the mycotoxin is important. The route of entry is important. Amount and duration of exposure. One of the things that presents a problem for us as clinicians is how do we explain where husband and wife are in the same house, the wife is sick, the husband is not. You tell the husband, I need you to do air quality testing, is $5,000, and possible mold remediation is $30,000. The first thing they say, you don't know what you're talking about, that is too expensive, I'm not going to do it. So the wife is sick, the husband is not, that's when the entities come. You need psychiatric help, you're having a moment, <laughs> and we're not doing that. I see that so much in the office. Or I get someone who is working in an office with a water leak. One, two, one person is sick, the rest of the employees are not sick. This one person is may or may not have a good work record, is complaining of symptoms, and you're asking them to do an evaluation. Most of the time, it's not done, or there's some reason to let the person go. I've seen that over and over. Or one of the employees say, it's the perfume. It's the perfume. It's what they're releasing in the building. That's what's giving them a problem. Most of the employers that I deal with when you start asking them to do studies in the office, you just put the biggest red flag up you've ever seen. And what they do is most of the time, they do nothing. The question has always been, why one person and not the next person? And the talk we just had before was very significant. Maybe that's it, it's all genetic. But how do we pick those people who are gonna be problematic. Do you do genetic testing on everyone to see if they have a risk? Can't do that. So when they get exposed, first thing that's 
having to do is deal with work relationship, if it's at work. At home, that's one thing. It has to do with the spouse and the husband and the cost. Because most of them, if it costs too much, they're not going to get it done anyway. And if you ask them to move out of the home, unless they have somewhere to move that's cost effective, they're not going to do it anyway. So you end up dealing with repetitive exposures and dealing with the health risks associated with the repetitive exposure. The bioavailability of aerosolized uh, particles, we talked about that and it's been talked, at, talked about over and over. It's always the size of the particle that makes a difference. Those respirable particles give us the worst time. When they go past the terminal bronchial, when they go past into the alveoli. That's where we have a problem with mostly dealing with the gas exchange. When there's a problem with gas exchange that's problematic for the person who's exposed continuously, and I have a slide to show you on that one. We've talked about this before, aspergillus aflatoxins, looking at um, aspergillus, inhibits protein synthesis, is, suppresses the immune system, uh, ochratoxin, again, we've all talked about this over and over, I'm not going to belabor the point, gliotoxin, again, aspergillus fumigotics, inhibits macrophage, infection with a a fumigatus and other microorganisms is affected by the gliotoxin. And patulum, trichocha the, the seams. But I'm speaking fast because I want to speak, spend some time on this. Thanks to IOM. IOM has done a wonderful job in getting people to understand building related or wet buildings and the mold effects from being exposed to wet buildings. However, just because IOM has put this forth doesn't mean our colleagues believe it. We deal with this constantly. If I speak to the allergists and talk to them about, look, published data, well, that's so nonspecific, that can be anything. Well, I have people in wet buildings all the time, they don't get sick. It has been constant trying to prove to them and to convince them that their wet buildings and mold has a problem. For the allergists, if they do sensitivity testing, prick tests, they don't find anything. The, my experience, it's not mold. You don't have a problem. It's not mycotoxins. Mycotoxins don't give you a problem. However, when they come up with these symptoms, as you can see, an upper respiratory infection is so nonspecific so it's cough and wheeze. I don't know about you, but I don't see these people until they've seen multiple people. They've been treated with upper respiratory infection and they've gone to the ENT physician. A lot of the times with ENT, from when they, a patient goes to them with a chronic cough and nasal symptoms, the first thing they get put on is Nexium. Everybody has reflux. Whether they have it or not, they have it. When they see the back of their throat and it's red and irritated, you have reflux. If you wheeze, you have reflux. If you have an upper respiratory infection, well, it looks like you've been around too many kids. You must have gotten this from somebody at work. But always an excuse, but they never mention, is your house wet? Did you have a water leak? Could you be exposed to mold, a damp environment? And I can guarantee you the treatment for each of these, antibiotic, antihist or an antihistamine, a bronchodilator, any time of cough you get some tussia necks, you may get an inhaler, you get a bronchodilator. With wheeze, everybody get a long acting bronchodilator, venolin, uh, and some prednisone. I don't think either one of these three doesn't get steroids in for some form of fashion. But the entity of mycotoxins never come up. I recently was being deposed on someone who was having respiratory symptoms secondary to been worked up by ad nauseum. They had been endoscopy, worked up from stem to sternum. 
I saw the patient and looked at her data, looked at the mycotoxin and said, look, I think this woman has developed asthma. I think it's related to a damp building that she was in. Well, needless to say, I sent her to the ENT to cover my basis, and he put down reflux. So with being said, the defense attorney chewed me up one side, down the other, because I didn't put exclude reflux. And I said, wait a minute. This lady had been scoped before. There was no evidence of reflux. She saw a GI doctor. Why should I do it again? It's already been done. And he said, doesn't matter. You didn't rule out reflux, because the ENT wrote reflux. And so it's just one of those things. When we deal with any type of respiratory, upper respiratory symptoms in patients that have been in wet buildings, moldy buildings, the differential has to be excluded because our colleagues don't believe in this. They don't believe in mycotoxins. They don't believe in damp buildings. They don't believe mold causes a problem. The simple statement all the time is, Mold is everywhere. What does it make one difference if aspergillus is everywhere? Penicillium is everywhere. Same statement over and over. And it's been my experience after dealing with this that anybody who comes in after seeing multiple doctors, I review the records, but I do my own workup too. I exclude reflux. I look for sinusitis. I look for, I do skin testing with the allergist, I exclude everything. In addition, I do a long, long occupational history, a personal history, and I just spend hours asking about their life, where they live, who else is sick, what are your hobbies, to try to narrow it down. There are a lot of times I see patients who come in complaining of coughing. I cough all the time. I have an excellent person that I use in Houston who is very good at doing air quality studies. Even when they absolutely tear the house apart from stem to sternum, no evidence of water intrusion, the patients are still coughing, they want an answer. And sometimes it has nothing to do with mold. Sometimes it has nothing to do with mycotoxins. I had several cases where patients had put in wonderful granite, and the granite was off-gassing. They had put in new carpet. The carpet, it was off-gassing. But you have to dig through that over and over again to try to get to the nitty-gritty in terms of what are these people's symptoms coming from. I have been criticized by my colleagues, no question, about looking at the mycotoxins, their exposures, and dealing with wet buildings, nonstop from ENT to pulmonary. Most of the pulmonologists who see patients, particularly with symptoms of cough, and they come in, they have their spirometry, you've got asthma, that's all you have going on out of here, it's just asthma. And the patients get upset because that's what they're told. You just have asthma. But they never give them a reason why. And they don't want to hear about it. They don't want to discuss it. It's asthma, get over it, take the medicines. But, they don't, but the problem is when the medicines don't work, you're giving them every steroid, every two weeks they're on prednisone, their cheeks are out to here looking like a chipmunk, and they're constantly giving them prednisone, 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 but never look at other entities. And that's one of the problems that we deal with over and over. The ILM had initially said the development of asthma was not associated with wet building. I thank you, Dr. Harriet, that has changed. And it looks from the study from Kathleen Christ and her group out of NIH. Once you have NIH buy-in, you've got to start. When they basically showed that a building that was wet, these people who were working in that building had no symptoms of asthma, but yet after being in that asthma, but building for a period of time, for a year, they had several who developed asthma. So that's an entity, that's a true problem. It helps us to help 
steer the patient when it comes to treatment. Our treatment modalities, and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this. When we have patients with asthma, the treatment modalities include bronchodilators, long-acting bronchodilators, including Semicord and Asmonex because they have an inhaled corticosteroid. You have Singular. But one of the things that's bothering me, we have patients, one, to 12, one in 12 has asthma. Our new therapy is bronchiothermoplasty. Anybody ever heard of that? One of the things that we, that's been done now for asthma is heating up the airway to stop the contraction of the smooth muscle in order to stop the bronchoconstriction. So thermobronchioplasty is you just putting a, a, a flexible tube in the airway and heating it up. And the consequences are bleeding, perforation, pneumonia. But wonder if it's not what we need to be doing. What if these people are in a bad home, a bad building, you take them out, you treat them appropriately if they have identification of mycotoxins, and we do, we, they get better. Instead of going to the next step of dealing with bronchiothermoplasty, it's a lovely procedure. It was started in Cleveland, but it has risk. And who do you use it on except every person who's coming in complaining of asthma that's not getting better? And if the majority of the people doing these procedures are pulmonologists who don't believe in mycotoxins and exacerbation of asthma, I think we're doing a disservice to the patient because they're the ones who don't believe that a wet building can cause an exacerbation of symptoms, but they're the ones who get the patient first. So after you, they are thermobronchioplasty, steroid, then you may see the patient. And a lot of the patients go to someone who's doing integrative medicine. The other type of person we talk about that has been associated with a wet building or the, is hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Have any of you guys seen patients with hypersensitivity pneumonitis? You know, you may get them on the forefront, forefront when they come in with respiratory symptoms, but the problem is a lot of the patients who are not aware that their homes can give them this, they leave, they get treated, most of them, with steroids, they come back, they leave, they come back. The problem is if you have chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis from repeated exposures, you can get on biopsy multinucleated giant cells and fibrosis. When you fibrose those lungs, I don't care how much steroids you give them, you can't get it back. One of my initial transplant patients that I saw had hypersensitivity pneumonitis. She had a leaking home when she lived in California. This is for, before anything was known about wet, building, uh, wet buildings, damp buildings, or mycotoxins. She stayed in the home and she developed pulmonary fibrosis. When they transplanted the lung, took the lung out, looked at the tissue, she had multinucleated giant cells, which means she was in a bad home. She never did anything about it. Nobody knew much about it. And she developed fibrosis as a consequence and ended up with a transplant. That was easy, easily preventable. You get out of the house, you take care of the problem, therefore you're not exposed to that, that um, risk of developing pulmonary fibrosis. When we talk about inhalation, the, the other respiratory effects from damp indoor environments has to do with fungal sinus disease hasn't been accepted, Airflow obstruction has not been accepted, and inhalation, fe fe inhalation fevers in non-occupational settings. I like to talk about fungus sinus disease. You know, Dr. Gray, you're correct. When Mayo di did their studies, they look at fungal sinus disease and recurrent sinusitis and symptoms in patients with fungal sinusitis at Mayo, did the biopsy, did the cultures. I can't get a routine ENT doctor when they do surgery for thickening in the sinuses to culture that for fungus. They'll culture, culture it for bacteria, but they don't culture it for fungus. When you talk to them about recurrent polyps that occur, oh, they just have allergies. Why don't you culture it 
for a fungus? Nope. And it's just been a repetitive problem. It doesn't matter where I send them for ENT, they don't do it. They just said a sinus is bacterially related, treat them with antibiotics, and that's it. Well, Mayo show that a recurrent sinusitis, you need to check for fungal infections. And all it takes is a nasal wash, uh, the appropriate nasal wash based upon your cultures. However, getting them to do that has been impossible. When we talk about respiratory disease secondary to fungal ex exposure, we know about pneumonias, we know about invasive fungal infections such as aspergillosis. However, when you look at the data when it talks about what happens with patients who have disseminated fungal infections, they always consider them to be immunocompromised from chemotherapy, steroids, mal malnutrition, HIV, cancer, they always say that these people only get fungal infections if they're immunocompromised. I beg to differ. My lady was not immunocompromised. She was healthy. She's small frame, fair, but she was not immunocompromised and she still developed disseminated aspergillosis. And initially, I thought I was gonna lose her, but it is still a problem. They also relate Asthma sensitized, and for fungal infection, asthma only occurs in sensitized individuals. That data has been proved erroneous also. You don't have to be sensitized to develop asthma-like symptoms. Initially, when you see them, you treat them pretty much the same. People come in complaining of wheezing, particularly at night, shortness of breath, with different type of activity, a persistent, nonstop cough. Hypersensitivity pneumonitis, we talked about, and ABBA. Allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis occurs usually in patients with asthma or cystic fibrosis. Their presentation is usually coughing, coughing, and fleeting infiltrates on chest x-ray. I could not find anything in the literature that talked about ABBA with mycotoxins, but I'm interested. The reason is these patients are colonized or sensitized to aspergillus. The way we diagnose this is an elevated IgE, elevated um, eosinophil count, and fungal titers consistent to reflect aspergillus fumigatus. The treatment is with antifungals and, of course, steroids. But we haven't gone down and looked at the effect what do, does mycotoxins have an effect on this since we're treating them just with steroids and antifungals? In the past, we didn't even use steroid antifungals. We just treated them with steroids. And these patients got better. It's only recently that they've added the combination of adding antifungals. So this would be something I'd like to see. And there's some information that we can glean from looking at mycotoxins, particularly with doing a lavage. Can I see if there's anything significant by the effect of mycotoxins on ABBA? I've been with the ACCP, American College of Chest Physicians, and American Thoracic Society. The American College of Chest Physicians, which we have conferences every year, I have yet to hear anybody talk about mycotoxins. And it's only recently that the American Thoracic Society, which is the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine, has listed mycotoxins as a reason for exacerbation of asthma. It was published in Update in Asthma in 2010. And they have definitely mentioned that mycotoxins could be a reason for exacerbation of asthma. Here's the study that they use. In asthma, they have cited that it's caused by T, Th2 cell mediated immune response. We know that airway hyperreactivity is one of the hallmarks. Chronic airway inflammation, damp environment includes uh, causing exacerbation in sensitized individual, and the role of mycotoxin has been evaluated. This is a study that they have cited. 
Exposure to mycotoxin increases the allergic removes immune response in a marine asthma model. They took mice, sensitized, sensitized them to ovalbumin, and then they exposed them to gliotoxin via the intratrachea and to patulum via the intestines. Mice were analyzed in acute and chronic asthma models. Airway responsiveness was measured based on a methicoline-induced airflow obstruction. The exposure, the results indicated that the gliotoxin and patulin increased the methicoline-induced airway hyper-responsiveness, hyper increased asthma-like phenotype, exacerbated chronic airway inflammation and airway remodeling, increased eosinophilic lung inflammation, and ovalbumin IgE-specific serum levels. This is an example of the methicoline challenge. This is for the gliotoxin, showing the increased airway hyperresponsiveness with the gliotoxin. This is one looking at patulin. They measured airway resistance and airway compliance. Airway resistance was increased. Airway compliance was decreased. They also looked at the different cell types that were involved, but most of all, they looked at the tissue itself. Looking at the ova, the ova and gliotoxin and the ova and patulin showed increased remodeling of the airways. One of the things that I think is important for us as clinicians, when I see the patients, they have been through, as I said, multiple physicians. One of the problems that I have is airway remodeling. We see patients who have bronchial hyperreactivity that they can respond to with bronchodilators. However, when you continue to have inflammatory cells in the BAL and you continue to have cells that affect those airways, at some point, you're not going to be able to reverse those airways. I've seen lots of people who have irreversible airway disease. 35-year-old guy who has an FEV1 of 35% are predicted. I can't reverse that. And come to find out, this guy is an inspector. He crawls through multiple wet buildings doing his job as an inspector for the city. As a consequence, he complained about his asthma getting worse. Unfortunately, he's a single father of three, and he stated he needed his job. Well, he's been through ENT, three ENTs, three allergies, and I got to see him. When I first thing I told him he was going to have to think about that job, he disappeared. It's, it's money. He needs the money for the job. But the problem is, an FEV1 of 35% are predicted, he's remodeled his airways. There was no reversibility. So even if I wanted to test him for mycotoxins to see if I could do something for him, I can't reverse that. Once it's fixed, it's fixed. And so it's beneficial to us to find these guys early to see if we can pull them out since we already know that the mycotoxins can affect, have effect of increasing airway hypersensitivity. We, are, we can see that based upon this study and that and the authors concluded, concluded that mycotoxins, mycotoxins could be responsible for the observed health effects of indoor moles causing <coughs> airway hyperreactivity. And it is thought to be secondary to a Th1 differentiation. Now, treating him or d treating someone with this through mycotox by bowel glutathione won't reverse scarred airways. Once those airways are fixed, 